Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Creating References Using 7th Edition APA Style, which is sponsored by the American Psychological Association. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas. <clears throat> developments and products of interest to the academic library community. These are free to users and they're structured 60 minute live presentations uh, that, <laughs> that allow for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, authors, vendors, and other interested stakeholders. All right, got through that. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of this screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and maybe a chat panel. If you don't see that chat panel, you can click the uh, little button with a dialog cloud at the bottom of your screen to open that up. And please uh, take some time, if you have questions, to drop them in the Q&A. We'll take a little bit of time ourselves at the end to make sure um, to answer any questions that you may have. We'll do as many as we have time for. There are a lot of you folks out there today, so um, please know we won't have time to get to everyone's questions, but we will try to get um, to at least some. All right, and if you're having any trouble, technical or otherwise, and you want to reach me, you can use the chat box to do that, um, and we will troubleshoot that offline. Today, we're using the uh, hashtag ACRL Choice webinars during the event, so if you get another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. All right, our speakers today are Haley S. Kamen, Chelsea L. Lee, and Timothy L. McAdoo from the American Psychological Association. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to Chelsea to start, or to Tim rather, to start things off. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you everyone for coming. We're so happy you're here. I'm going to jump right in. We have a lot to cover. Um, and to that end, uh, here are the learning objectives for today. Um, first, we'll cover some of the fundamentals of creating APA style references, reference lists, and in-text citations. Uh, that's items one, two, and three. And then uh, starting with uh, item four gets really interesting. We're going to share some APA style secrets that we want you to know. We want everyone to know. Uh, then we'll talk about DOIs and URLs and how to decide when to include them in a reference. And we'll also talk about when to include a retrieval date. And a spoiler alert, it's not very often, but we'll get to that. Um, then we'll be looking at how to create a reference when the work that you're trying to cite is missing key information. Uh, number seven is um, we'll be discussing how to create a reference to a work found in an academic database. We know you have lots of questions about that. Uh, and then we'll be practicing those. These will be some interactive slides um, where you can help us put together a reference. Okay, so first, uh, let's see, what, what is it that uh, makes up a reference? You'll be um, hearing us talk a lot about the elements of a reference in this presentation. Those are the four pieces in a reference that answer the questions who, when, what, and where. That's author, date, title, and source. And um, in this presentation, um, to answer those four questions, we'll be showing journal articles, books, reports, and web pages, but the basic principles cover literally anything you want to cite. So uh, author, date, title, and source. You, you can see those elements in any of the templates that are available in chapter 10 of the publication manual. And uh, the examples in that chapter are grouped by category. So periodicals, and then books, and then reports, and so on. And each category begins with a template that looks like the one you can see here. Um, so for this example, if you're looking at a journal article um, and you have the template in front of you, you can, you can select an option from each column to put together your reference. Uh, let's see, so the, the, the template, each column shows the possibility for the details that can be in the reference and it also shows the formatting of those details. Uh, and we'll look at um, this, each of these elements in more detail in just a few slides. Here is a, a typical journal article, and you can see the four pieces, the four elements of the reference. We've um, circled them in, in um, boxes there, and then you can see how that translates to the reference at the bottom with just a, a little bit of um, formatting change. Uh, 
So uh, starting with the author element, as you can see in the first bullet, we use the, the term author um, to mean whoever is responsible for the work. So that's an individual, it can be a group, um, it might be a, an editor, a film director, it's, it's whoever is responsible for, for the work, whether, they, whether it's written or not. Um, so when a work is written by a, um, an individual, you can see the first couple examples there, one person or two people. When it's a group, you've got the group name, and when it's a government agency, it, gets, um, uh, it, it can look a little complicated, and uh, we have a, a tip for you here. We recommend that you include the most, most specific agency. So in that example, it's the National Institutes of Mental Health, and that is one of 27 um, agencies that make up the National Institute of Health, which in turn is a, a, a sub-department of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So the report or the, the web page that you're looking at may look complicated. Um, but you can simplify the author element by using just the specific agency. And the rest of that information is not lost. It just shows up later in the reference, as we'll, we'll see later in this presentation. Um, this also this has the effect of making your in-text citation easier as well, because um, as we'll see, the, the citations um, are one-to-one -one correspondence with the author and date element of So um, a change you may have heard about in the seventh edition is that you can now include up to 20 authors in the reference. So if the work has one or two or up to 19 authors, you can put them in the reference. Uh, if up to 20 authors, you can put them in the reference. Um, when you get past 20 authors, um, what you do is include the first 19, an ellipsis, and then the name of the last author. And the goal here it was twofold. First, it gives credit to more people. We can get more author names in the reference without making it so long, we obviously couldn't, you can't include everyone if it's 100 authors, but um, it gives credit to many more authors. And then secondly, it, for, the, for you, the person writing the, the reference, it makes the guideline easier. You don't run into the threshold as frequently. Uh, and when you do, um, it's in example four in chapter 10, or it's on our website, so you can look up the formatting details. All right, so one more quick thing about author types. Um, again, they can be individuals, they can be groups. Um, for articles, journal articles, books, usually individuals, but um, sometimes it's a task force. It, it can be a group author. Typically, it's an individual or many individuals. Uh, for a web page, it's the reverse. Uh, they're often group authors. Um, uh, usually group authors, so sometimes you can't have individual authors, so you have to look at what you've actually got. We, we always say, cite what you see. And then for reports, um, again, it's like what you see. So um, it can be a little trickier, but we, um, we tell people to look for whether there are individual people credited on the cover page. Sometimes it's the second page, sometimes it's the last page. Um, if they're clearly credited as the authors, use those individual names as the author. Otherwise, it's the group um, agency. Okay, so that brings us to the date element, the second element in a reference. Um, usually just the year. For many publications, it's just the year. It can be more specific. Um, it can be a year and a month. It can be a year and a specific date. Um, generally, works published more frequently have more specific dates in the reference. And if you're in doubt, here's, here's what to do. Look at what type of document you're creating. Look at the actual document you're, you're reading and you want to cite. And then take a look in the templates, find that type of document, and see what the templates show as possibilities, um, or look at the examples. You might find the exact case in the example. Uh, and later in this presentation, we'll talk about what to do when there's no date, and also look at the variety of date options that you'll see on a web page, and, and we'll go into that in, in more detail. So for uh, titles, Titles, uh, you're going to see them on the title page, your cover page, sometimes in a database record, depending on what you've got. Um, you just write the title in the reference um, in sentence case, which um, means capitalizing the first word, any uh, proper nouns, and the first word of a subtitle. And some titles are italicized and some are not, and we know that there are lots of questions around that, and we, we definitely cover that in, in more detail later in this presentation as well. Um, something else that you'll put, uh, you can put in the title element of the reference is a bracketed description. 
So um, these are used in some references to help the reader understand the type of document you're looking at. Um, references are so consistent that um, these, these bracketed descriptions help you um, show what the, what the document type is. So usually that's for works that are outside of the peer-reviewed academic literature or works that are not text-based. And again, you can see lots of examples in, the, uh, in chapter 10. Uh, in, in this slide, you can see the, um, the example is um, a video. The title is A Day in the Life Nursing at Michigan, and then the bracketed description is video. So it's probably a YouTube video. Um, if you're creating a, a reference to a type of work that you don't see an example for, you can add your own bracketed description. Uh, use, use a short phrase, capitalize the first letter, um, just be consistent if you have more than one in your reference list. Okay, and so the fourth element of uh, a reference, an APA style reference, is the source. And this, um, again, depends on the document type. So you want to look at your document type and uh, it's a periodical. Um, you're going to have the periodical title and um, volume and associated information. Uh, uh, if it's a book or a website, you'll have the publisher, the website name. Uh, and then many, many references include a, either a DOI or a URL. And um, uh, again, we'll go into a, a, the, We'll go into the details about the DUI and the URL later in this presentation. Lots of questions about how to decide which to include, and uh, we hope to cover that later. Um, in this table, um, if you look at the government report, um, the source section of the government report, that's where the parent agencies are for that um, NIMH example from earlier in the presentation. Okay, so to recap, there are four parts of an APA style um, reference, author, date, title, and source. Um, you can just put them together in that order to create the reference and place a period between each element, uh, between uh, after the author element, the date element, and the title element, and after the periodical or publisher or website name in the source element. Um, don't add a period after the DOI or the URL because that might interfere with the linking. And um, references in APA style are, do use a hanging indent, as you can see on this slide. Okay, so once you have, you have one reference, you're gonna have a whole list of references. Um, that list should start on a new page uh, with, a, with the word references in bold, um, centered at the top. Um, double space the entire list, the, um, both the entries themselves and around the entries, so double space the entire list. Um, alphabetize the entries, um, and then if there are multiple works uh, by the same author um, or authors, then they are arranged in chronological order. And you can see that here. Um, American Psychological Association is a group author name, and it's an A. It starts at the beginning. You've got the next one, and then the, the, the third and fourth are the same author, um, so those are chronological. There's a lot more detail about how to order your references if you get into um, uh, more complicated things, um, and that's all in chapter nine. Um, so we have a reference and we have a reference list, and so now we'll, that brings us to uh, how to cite these references in the text. Um, so as you can see, you should cite every reference, um, every reference and, and vice versa. So um, exceptions to that are personal communications, which um, are covered in section 8.9. And um, so we recommend creating the reference first because you can see in this uh, example, the, the reference um, guides how to create the citation. So the citation uses the surname or surnames um, that are in the author element and it uses the year that's in the date element. In-text citations um, can be parenthetical or narrative and examples are here. Um, this shows how to format uh, one author, two authors, three authors or more, or group authors. And as you can see, there's something else new in the seventh edition. You can um, abbreviate to et al. for uh, references that have three or more authors, even the first time you cite. You can start with et al. and use that consistently throughout your paper. Um, also shown here in the group author with abbreviation, this, this shows you how you can include and uh, define an abbreviation the first time you have a group author when you cite, 
And then from that point on, if you cite multiple times, you can use that abbreviation, um, but still in the reference itself, spell out the entire, uh, spell out the, the name in full. Okay, so, and here we have uh, sort of a, a summary of how we recommend citing. So first, you wanna read the work that you wanna cite. You identify the area, the idea that you wanna put in your paper. Write a sentence about that, and that might be paraphrasing the idea. It could be quoting directly. Um, and then so steps four and five here are the key. So if you create the reference first, that'll guide you on how to make the in-text in -text citation, which is, again, the author uh, name or names and the year or the um, date element. And then six, repeat. Um, okay, so that was a quick run through the sort of the fundamentals of uh, APA style references and citations. And um, uh, I think this is on to Chelsea to, to share some secrets. Hello, everyone. So today I am going to share with you seven style secrets we APA style experts want you to know, including this cat. This cat also wants you to know. Our first secret is about document type. The number one question us APA style experts receive is definitely, how do I cite an online document? But it's really a trick question because any kind of work can be online. And reference formats for APA style are based on document type. So you already heard Tim talk about a bunch of different document types. And just to reemphasize for that, you re emphasize for that you here, um, some examples of those are journal articles, magazine and newspaper articles, books, ebooks, reports, films, YouTube videos, web pages, social media. So what you need to do is to identify the document type of the work that you're looking at and then find the reference example that you need. The second thing I want to talk about is retrieval method. It's important not to confuse document type with retrieval method. So some examples of retrieval method are on the internet, at the library, from an academic research database, from interlibrary loan, you borrowed a book from a friend. Retrieval method usually doesn't matter for references. Instead, as we said it previously, you wanna focus on the document type. So just because you got it online doesn't matter very much for the reference. Piggybacking off of that, we have secret three about web pages and websites. For APA style, when we use the word web page, we mean a document type, not a retrieval method. And we have a new category in the seventh edition manual called web pages and websites. And that category is a category of last resort. So you should use it only if no other category fits better for the work that you want to cite. So if you're looking at a report on a website, you should use the report template. If you're looking at an ebook online or in a database, you should use the book template. If you're looking at an article on a database or on a website somewhere, you should use the article template. So only in the case where you're on a web page and nothing else seems to fit, then the web page and websites category is the one that you want to use. Secret number four, I want to talk about online and print works. The same templates in Chapter 10 are used for both online and print works. And in fact, online and print references are often identical. Um, one difference might be whether the reference has a URL or not. But by and large, they're the same. Uh, a change in the seventh edition has to do with how ebooks are cited. Our uh, references no longer include ebook versions. So, like if you use the Kindle version of the book, you don't put that in the reference anymore. And an additional piece is that if a work has a DOI, you should include the DOI even if you used a print, even if you used a print version. So the example on the screen uh, of a reference refers to both the print book and the ebook. And the point of this is that the reader who's looking at the reference would be able to get the book in whatever format they want. There are exceptions for if your book, if your version has something special about it, like if it's a, an abridged audiobook, you can note that in brackets after the title. But if it's um, just the standard version, then you don't need to make anything special in the reference. Secret five, to reiterate something that Tim had mentioned, is cite what you see. This is a core principle of APA style. 
so you can use the information you see on the work in its reference list entry. Then you just have to make a few adjustments to make the reference. One of the main adjustments is to abbreviate the author names. So you'll use the surname and then take the full first name and put initials instead. Uh, another adjustment you'll make is the capitalization of the title. So APA style titles in references use sentence case, and Tim touched on that earlier. And uh, you can see as well in the example here on this screen that the cover of the book has the title in all capital letters. And so that's something that we've, we've adjusted. Additionally, if you're missing some information, you just leave it out. Uh, for example, if you're on an online newspaper article and it doesn't have page numbers, then you don't need to put no pages. You just skip that part. But when you're in doubt, you can include more information rather than less. And later in this presentation, Haley's going to get into more about how to deal with the missing information. Secret six has to do with the format patterns that are used in the seventh edition reference system. So one of the updates that we made was to streamline the reference system so that every reference follows one of two format patterns. The two format patterns are either italic title or italic source. Standalone works, things like books, reports, dissertations and theses, films, TV series, social media, web pages, all of these work standalone and they use the italic title format pattern. Works that are part of a greater whole, things like journal articles, which are part of a journal, or magazine or newspaper articles, which are part of a magazine or newspaper, or an edited book chapter that's part of an edited book. These are all works that are part of a greater whole, and they all use the italic source pattern. So what you need to do is to determine the document type to know the format pattern. And the best part is that because many document types share a pattern, if you know the pattern, you're going to get the reference right, even if you're not sure of the specific document type. So if you think, if you're deciding between report and web page, they use the same pattern, so it's going to work out. And additionally, most works use the italic title format, so we recommend that if you really are not sure, to use the italic title. Here are two examples of the format patterns. In the first example, we have a book that has an italic title, and the italic part is highlighted in yellow. For the italic source, the example is a journal article, and the title of the journal and the volume number are both italic, also highlighted in yellow. So I want to talk specifically about web pages. Something new for the 7th edition is that we assigned web pages to the italic title format pattern. Previously in the 6th edition, sometimes the title of a web page was not italic, and sometimes it was, depending on your assessment of whether the work was part of a greater whole or stood alone. And that was something that caused a lot of confusion, and we knew that a standard format for web pages was going to make everybody's life easier. The reason that we picked italic format for web pages is that we found that most of the time when people were confused about what template to use, they were confusing web pages with reports and ebooks. The thing about web pages now is that we have a standard format to make your life easier. And you know that if you're using the web page category, that means that you are going to know what pattern to follow. And because the three types that I had mentioned of web pages, reports, and ebooks all follow the same pattern, the reference is correct even if you are not sure about the document type because the ones you're guessing between all use the same pattern. One pair that is a bit confusing is citing the news. Okay, so one pair that I want to continue talking about the new, how to cite the news. Uh, one pair that is a bit confusing has to do with citing the news. And the reason that you have this confusing pair is because there are two format patterns, and so there's a line. It has to be somewhere. And the place that it is is got to do with the news. And what happens is that newspaper and magazine articles, or periodicals, those use the italic source. Whereas 
stories on news websites like CNN or web pages, and those use the italic title. So, what you should do is use the periodical format. If you see the word newspaper or a magazine on an About Us page, or if there's a print issue that can be delivered to your house, that means the periodical format with the italic source. And otherwise, if you're on the CNN website or BBC News or HuffPost, that's the italic title format. And we have plenty of examples and further explanation in um, Chapter 9 of the Publication Manual and examples in Chapter 10. The last secret that I want to talk about is about adapting APA style. So the APA style manual is written to serve everyone. It's written to serve students and professionals, whether you're at the beginning of your career or you just started college. And we know that some audiences need special approaches. And so we definitely recommend that professors and institutions and publishers adapt APA style to fit their needs. And just two examples of this that people commonly ask us about are, one of them is about database information, which I'm gonna talk about more later. APA includes it only sometimes. Um, APA includes the database information only sometimes, but if you want to include it all the time, you can. Um, another adaptation has to do with links. So typically, the links in an APA style paper would be like the actual text of the URL because APA works are published in both print and online. But if you're doing a work that's only online, you can place your links beneath descriptive text if you want. So those are just two examples of differences that you um, can make to adapt APA style. So I'm going to hand it over now to Haley, who's going to talk about DOIs, URLs, and retrieval dates. Hi, all. Thanks again um, for being with us today. So as Chelsea mentioned, in this next set of slides, I'll be discussing DOIs, URLs, and retrieval dates. And this is an area where the seventh edition provides updated guidance and clearer directions on when to include this electronic locator information in your references. And so when present, the DUI or URL is going to be the final component of your reference list entry. And because many works are now available and retrieved online, most reference list entries will end with either a DUI or a URL. So when creating a reference entry for a work, always look to see whether it has a DUI or digital object identifier, which is a unique alphanumeric string assigned by the publisher. It identifies the work, provides a persistent link to its location on the internet. And the key piece of guidance when it comes to DUIs is this. If the work has a DUI, include it as the final piece of your reference entry. This applies to all works that have a DUI, both online and in print. So if you see a DUI, always include it. And if you include a DUI, do not also include a URL. A reference entry will not include both a DUI and a URL, and the DUI takes precedence as the one to include in your reference. So if you see both, only include the DUI. Most journal articles will have a DUI, as well as some other types of works, like books or book chapters. That DUI may be shown on the title page of an article or chapter, on the copyright page of a book, or in a database record. That's where you got your work from. If you're not sure whether the work you're using has a DUI, or you just need to add it to your reference layer and don't feel like going back to that original work that you used, you can search for the DUI on crossref.org. Crossref offers a DUI search function where you can simply cut and paste your reference into a search box and search for its DUI. So APA style follows the current recommendation for DUI format set by the International DUI Foundation which is a hyperlink format shown here in that green and yellow highlighting. And that DUI will always start with HTTPS in the DUI.org piece highlighted in green and end with the unique DUI number beginning with one zero. Note that in the seventh edition, the label DUI by itself is no longer used. And we use, the DUI for, we use this new DUI format because it provides a direct link to the work thereby simplifying and standardizing retrieval for all users. And this preferred format has changed over time. So it's possible that the work you're using shows a DUI in a different format. For instance, you might see the letters DUI in a colon as shown here, 
or you might see a hyperlink starting with HTTP and then DX DOI is also shown on the screen. If so, if you see the hyperlink written these different ways, you're going to need to change the DOI to match the preferred format for all entries in your reference list, which involves editing the beginning of the DOI to match the green highlighted part in the example. It's then up to you whether to make the DOI hyperlink blue and underline, which is the default setting of many word processing programs, or black with no underline. Although the blue live hyperlink is the preferred format for works in intended to be read online. And whatever link style you choose, make sure to apply it consistently across all entries in your reference list. So references for works with DUIs, like most journal articles, include the DUI at the end of the source element. But references for most online works without a DUI include the works URL or uniform resource lo locator at the end of its reference list entry. So references inclusion of a URL depends on the following. The work was found online, the work does not have a DUI, and the link for the URL will work for readers. So you're usually going to know whether you found the work online and whether you see a DUI for that work. To know if the URL will work for readers, ask yourself whether someone outside of your institution would be able to access and read that work. If not, say because they need a subscription, to log into the database where the work is found, then do not include a URL. Because that URL is not going to work for readers and the purpose of a reference is to provide a way for readers to retrieve the work you used. Therefore, it is not helpful to provide a URL that those reading it cannot access once they go there. For this reason, database URLs are not usually included in references. If this sounds kind of complicated, don't worry. Chelsea will talk you through how to handle references for work from academic research databases later in this presentation. So when including a URL in your reference, copy and paste it directly from the address bar of your internet browser into your reference entry to make sure it's entered correctly. Again, you can choose to make the hyperlink blue and underlined or black with no underline. And as mentioned earlier, do not add line breaks manually to the hyperlink or add a period after a URL or a DUI, which may interfere with link functionality. And of course, make sure your URLs work before and continue to work by checking all URLs in the reference list before submitting your paper. The URL you use in your paper should link directly to the cited work whenever possible. Because the hyperlink will lead readers directly to the content, you never need to include the words accessed from before a URL. And do not write the words retrieved from before a URL, except in the select cases of works that require a retrieval date, which I'll be discussing next. So in the seventh edition, there are now only a select number of cases in which reference entries need to include a retrieval date in the source element. These are cases when the work is designed to change over time as information changes or new information is added, and when the page you are looking at is not archived. Note that when a stable or archived version of the work you are citing is available, you can include the URL to that in your reference entry and not a retrieval date. However, both of these conditions rarely apply, so that the majority of references do not need retrieval dates. The types of references that might are noted in the applicable reference examples in Chapter 10, and these are often things like wikis and open educational resources that do not have an archival link or permalink, web pages that are frequently updated and the versions are not archived, like online dictionary entries and social media profiles, and databases that are still in collection and intended to change over time. Including a approval date when citing an unarchived or not stable work that is likely or meant to change indicates to your reader that the version of the work they retrieve may be different from the version that you use is why we include it in these specific cases. And then when you do need to include a retrieval date, use the format des described here and highlighted in the example in yellow, which is the word retrieved, the month, day, and year, and then from, and the URL of the work at the end of the reference entry. So now that you know how to handle all the elements of a reference entry, the next set of slides will talk about what to do when information for a reference element is missing from a work. Shown here is Table 9.1 from Section 9.4 of the Publication Manual, and it breaks down how to assemble the elements of a reference entry and what adjustments need to be made when one or more reference element is missing. For instance, the third row, starting with author, describes what to do when the information needed for the author element of a reference entry is not available. This is done for all combinations of missing reference elements. In all cases, templates are provided, 
on the right at the side of your slide that show how to create a reference list entry and in-text citation that you can follow. Just plug in the information from the work you are using to create your own reference and in-text citation. I will note that because these are general templates meant to be applied in all cases, and because italic formatting of the title versus source element varies by the specific reference category, italics are not shown in this table here in the book. You want to go to Chapter 10 of the Publication Manual for the template of the specific reference category of the work you're using to determine whether to italicize the title or source element as applicable. In this presentation, also we'll talk about what to do in all the instances shown in this table. But again, you can always look back at this recorded presentation or at the publication manual for that info. And now I will go through how to handle references missing one of the four main elements, an author, date, title, or source. So starting with author, author for some works, the author, for some works like journal articles and books, you don't usually have to worry about having no author because the individual authors or authors are obvious and listed clearly on the cover or title page. For other works, especially online works, the author may be harder to identify and you may be ready to say there is no author, but not so fast. Do not assume that just because you do not see individual names listed on the work that there is no author. Often the author is actually the organization that authored the report or web page or other work. This might be a nursing association, government agency, nonprofit, working group, professional organization, hospital, or some other institution or organization. So before treating a work as having no author, consider whether a group or organization on the report, web page, or other work is the author. And if so, use that group as the author. You might also look at an about us, author, or similarly labeled page for the on the website for the individuals or group listed there. Note that if the group that wrote or created the work is also the publisher of it, only include the group name in the author position and do not include that same group in the source element as well. So if you've done your due diligence and you can identify or there is no author, then do not include an author in your reference. Wikipedia entries and religious works are examples that are usually treated as having no author. For more examples and how to create their reference entries, you can see chapter 10 of the publication manual. And when this is the case, move the title of the work to the author position at the start of the reference before the date followed by a period. Note that that title is also what appears in the corresponding in-text citation for that work as well. Then in the, in the reference list, alphabetize the entry by the first word of the title, ignoring prepositions like a, an, or the. So sometimes it's the date, publication date of a work that is unknown or cannot be determined. Common works that are without dates are online dictionary entries, some web pages, and social media profiles. So for works with no date, you'll write the letters ND, which stands for no date, in parentheses, as the second element of the reference entry. Put a period after the N and after the D with no space in between those letters, again in parentheses, and followed by a period, and then provide the work's title and source. The date also appears as ND in the corresponding in-text citation for that work. And in your reference list, references with no date will be listed before references with a date. So another problem you may run into has to do with web page and website dates. And we know that identifying the dates on web pages and websites can be confusing. Often because when citing web pages and websites, there's the potential of having too many dates. So you want to make sure that the copyright date in the footer of the web page, you may think that the, that copyright date is a date to use in your reference. But you actually want to make sure that the copyright date in fact applies to the content that you are citing. It isn't just for the whole web page when it was created. So instead, better dates to use are the date of last publication for the web page you're on when that's available, or if the web page you're on indicates a date of last update, you can use that in your reference. What you should not use is the copyright date from a web page footer, as I mentioned, because this date may not indicate when the content on that page was published. And also don't use the date of last review, because just because the content was reviewed does not mean that anything was actually changed. So if there is no separate date of publication indicated for the web page you are using, treat the work as having no date and write ND as the date as described on the previous slide. So next we'll move on to what to no title. So more works will have a clear title. If a title does seem hard to find, you can start by looking at the text shown on the cover of a book, the first page of an article or report, or the heading of a web page. 
visual cues like a larger font or bolding are often indicators of what is meant to be the work's title. If retrieving work from a database or from another paper's reference list, you may also look at how it is labeled there. Sometimes you might not be quite sure if you've identified the official date uh, on a work, and especially a website. But usually your best guess of what constitutes a title is right. It's also going to be what your readers see when they access that same work. And this applies to things like subtitles as well. You may not be sure if something was intended to be a subtitle, but if you feel confident, it's important to identifying the work, include it as a subtitle in your reference. Basically, as long as you provide the information that your readers need to retrieve the work you use, and your readers can feel confident that they are looking at the same work you use, your title will be correct. For work that are in fact without a title, such as things like, say, a data set or a photograph, include a description of the work in square, square brackets as the second element of your reference entry after the date, as shown here in the highlighted part of the example. When possible, specify the medium as part of the description to avoid having two bracket descriptions back to back for both the title and the type of work. For instance, in this example in yellow, the description includes both a type of work, a photograph series, and a description of what it's showing the famine in Yemen. More examples of works with different variations of titles and missing titles are described in chapter nine and shown in chapter 10 of the publication manual. So finally, we've gotten to no source, the last element of a reference. So when creating a source element of a reference, it's important to remember that the point of a reference is to provide a pathway for readers to follow to access the works you use in writing your paper. Readers cannot retrieve a work if the source is no longer available, and correspondingly, a reference without a recoverable source should not be included in your reference list because the readers cannot retrieve that work. This applies to online works that are no longer accessible because the URL is broken. That is why before submitting a paper, you should test the URLs in your reference list to ensure that they work and take you to the expected place and update them if not. Do not include broken URLs in your paper. Instead, if the content you cited is no longer available online, search for an archive version of the page on the Internet Archive and use the archive URL. If no archive version is available, Find a new work on the topic to cite instead, and then replace that non-recoverable reference with one that is recoverable. Works without a source because they are never recoverable are things like emails, phone calls, classroom lectures, and internet sources. And those should be cited in the text of your paper only as personal communications and not included in the reference list. Personal communications are discussed in detail in Section 8 and 9 of the Publication Manual for anyone looking for more information. So that takes us through the missing parts of a reference element or a reference entry. So we'll now turn the presentation over to Chelsea to tell you about how to create reference list entries for content access for academic research database. Hello again. So I'm going to talk about works that came from an academic research database. Most important thing is not to panic. So when we say academic research databases, uh, there's so many out there. And your school has subscriptions to different ones. But some really common popular ones are APA PsycInfo, EBSCOhost, Ovid, ProQuest, Scopus, Google Scholar, PubMed, ERIC, Medline, there's a lot. And your library most likely provides tons of information about which databases your school has subscriptions to and which ones specialize in different topics. The important thing for APA style is to know that database information appears in APA style references depending on two things. First, it depends on whether the work has a DOI, and then it depends on the work's level of circulation, how easy it is to get. When a work has a DOI, put the DOI in the reference list entry, and you don't need database information. When the work doesn't have a DOI, you have to ask if it's of wide or limited circulation. When it's of wide circulation, you don't need database information. And you might have a URL, depending on if the URL will work, as Haley had discussed. And if, the, if it's of limited circulation, meaning it's hard to get, you need to go to this exact database to get it, you do put database information in the reference. And then maybe a URL if the URL is going to work. Now I'm going to take you through these cases in more detail with some examples. So first, talking about works with DOIs from academic research databases. If you have a DOI, put it in your reference and do not add database information. 
So the example on the screen, I got it from APA Psych Info, but APA Psych Info does not appear in the reference because this work has a DOI. Looking now at the case of a work without a DOI, but it's of wide circulation, you do not need to include database information in the reference. So some examples of widely available works are journal articles, which usually have DOIs, magazine and newspaper articles, books, ebooks, and edited book chapters. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see an example citation for an ebook. The ebook is available from the Ovid database and it does not have a DOI. But even though you got it from Ovid, Ovid does not appear in the reference because the work a book is widely available. So once you know the list of the kinds of works that are widely available, you'll know whether or not necessary to include database information. Next, I want to look at works that don't have a DOI and are of limited circulation. So this is the case where you do include database information in the reference. Examples of databases that contain works of limited circulation are ProQuest Dissertations in Disease Global, ERIC, UpToDate, the Cochrane D Database of Systematic Reviews, and digital course packets from a publisher's proprietary platform, like Revel, Connect, yeah. So the idea here is that the reader has to go to that database to get that work. So you're giving them the information. You should also include a, a URL for the work if the URL is going to work for readers. If it's not going to work because it's session specific or it requires you to log in before it resolves, just end the right reference after the database name. So here is the first of three examples of database information and references. This one is a dissertation from the ProQuest Dissertations and Theses Global Database. Dissertation is a work that stands alone, so it has an italic title. Uh, and then you include the database name, not in italics because you already used italics on the title. And this database, you have to log in for, uh, the, for, for, for a URL to work, so you just end after the database name. So if I was reading a paper and I saw this reference, I would go through my school and go to their access point for ProQuest Dissertations and Thesis Global, and that's how I would be able to get my hands on this dissertation. Another common database uh, that appears in references is ERIC. ERIC contains a mix of works. So some of the works in there are widely available, and those are things like journal articles. And other things are limited circulation. Those are things like direct manuscripts, reports, and monographs. So if you see something that's a journal article, then you don't mention ERIC at all. But if it's one of these other limited circulation cases, then you do mention the database, which is ERIC. Here, uh, the works that are of limited circulation, again, use the italic title format. And after you provide the title, provide the database name without italics. And then for this database, the URL will work, so you can include it in your reference. The third case I want to talk about is the up-to-date database. This is a special case and it, it works in a weird way, and so we'll just explain how it works so you know what to do. So up to date, if you're not familiar with it, is a database that contains articles only in that database. That's the only place you can get them from. And the whole database is only those articles. And so for that reason, in the seventh edition, we treat that database like it's a journal, like it's a periodical. So what you do is you put the authors of the work, the year of last update, which is one of the pieces of information always given, the title of the article, database name in italics as though it's a journal, and then this one needs a retrieval date because the articles are updated, hence the name up to date, and they're not archived, so you can only ever see the current version. Then we'll have a URL because it will work for readers. So even though you have to log in to see the whole article, the URL still gets you there and then it will prompt you versus you put the URL in and it's just gibberish and it takes you nowhere. So this URL will get you there and so that's why you can include it. 
So you may wonder, why no database information? And the reason here is that API styles to serve everyone. People have access to different databases. Content can change. Works are available in many places. And this makes database information meaningful to readers. So when you see a database name in a reference, that means you have to use it. And if you don't see it, you can use any database you have access to. So this brings us to the uh, conclusion of our presentation before we do our Q&A, wherein we want uh, you attendees to play along at home with us and create API style references. So we're going to look at three cases together. The first case that we're going to look at is an open textbook. So this is a screenshot of an open textbook on their open textbook website. And I've drawn colored boxes around the four elements of authors, the date, the title of the work, which here is American government, and the source. So let's look at some questions. Our first question, and you'll see a poll question in your screen that you can answer, is what reference format should you use for an open textbook? A, web page, B, e, online document, C, book, or D, I'm not sure. All right, so correct answer is C, book. Open textbooks are cited like books, so they use the italic format pattern. And lots of works that you might not think are books are actually books. So for example, um, reference works like dictionaries are cited like books, as are diagnostic manuals. So I see from our results here that most of you got the right answer of book, so I'm glad to hear that. Our second question is, who is the publisher of the work? Our choices are A, OpenStax, B, Google, C, there is no publisher, or D, I am not sure. Again, your Poll options on your screen will allow you to submit what answer you think. Right, the poll has ended, and we find out that the answer is A, OpenStax. So OpenStax publishes this open textbook. OpenStax is also the name of the website, and so this is another example where if you thought it was, um, it. It, uh, you, if you thought it was a web page, you'd still get the right answer. And I see that the majority of you got that right. That's awesome. Question three, what date information should appear in the reference? We have the year of last update, the original publication year, C, the retrieval date, D, both A and C, E, both B and C, or F, I'm not sure. All right, so correct answer is D. You should include both the year of last update and this open textbook has versions that are designed to change. It's open, so you can go in and edit it. And they're not archived, which you would find out if you were on the web page. Here's the final reference for the open textbook. It contains the author, date, title, publisher, retrieval date and URL, and its two in-text citations. Let's look at the second case. Here's a YouTube video. Our first question is, what reference format should you use to cite this YouTube video? A, a web page, B, social media, C, YouTube video, or D, I'm not sure. The correct answer here is C, YouTube video. There's a specific format for YouTube videos and other streaming videos that's in example 90 of the publication manual. Let's get to our next question here. I want to know who is the author 
of this work. Our choices are A, YouTube, B, Feminist Frequency, C, There Is No Author, or D, I Am Not Sure. And the poll options are just appearing on screen. The answer in this case is B, Feminist Frequency. You want to use the name of the channel that uploaded the video as the author. And the examples show this. And I see that a majority of you got that right. That's awesome. So here is our third question and what's going to be our final question so that we can make sure to get two questions from you all, which is, uh, this work is outside the peer-reviewed academic literature. So what information does it need? A description of form, like video, an asterisk, nothing special, or D, I'm not sure. So you may remember back to the very beginning when we discussed this. The correct answer in this case is A, a description of form video. If you're describing the work as a video in square brackets, that indicates that it's outside the peer academic, the peer reviewed academic literature, and also that it's not text, it's a video that you can watch. So I am going to show you the final reference, which is here. You have the author, the full date, the title in italics, the description, the website name, which is YouTube, and the URL, as well as the accompanying citation. So this brings us to the end of our um, formal presentation. And what we are going to do now is present a couple of poll questions to you, our audience, about what you thought of the presentation and of uh, references in seventh edition style. And we also will have an opportunity to answer some questions that you all have posed to us in the chat in the Q&A. And so I will put up on screen while you're thinking of any questions that you might have our contact information. So some, uh, we have a brand new revamped APA style website that includes all the inf updated information about 7th edition, tons of resources about citations and references, as well as other areas of style, such as uh, punctuation and capitalization and, and other mechanics and format, as well as sample. If you enjoyed this webinar, you will be able to watch it again. It has been recorded will be available on the ACRL Choice YouTube channel, and it's going to be linked to from our website on our instructional aids page. And if you have questions that you think of later, we have an email address for that at styleexpert at aca.org, as well as social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So with that, let's see if Haley has some questions that came from you all. Hi, Al. So I know that we're out of time. Um, but we'll just pose a couple questions to Tim and Chelsea to answer some of the things that came up during the presentation. And again, these slides will be recorded and the recording will be viewable on the APA Stella page as well as ACRL Choices YouTube channel so that you can hear all these questions later and view the presentation all, um, at a later time. So Tim and Chelsea, um, one question we got was some people had concerns about if you have long URLs, and you're not supposed to break them, what are you supposed to do? Are there rules for where to break URLs at the end of lines? What do you, how do you handle these long um, URLs in your paper reference list? Okay, um, I'd be happy to answer that. So option one is that you can just let it be long. There's nothing wrong with that. Paste mm -hmm. it in your paper and leave it. And if the computer processing, if the word processing program makes it beyond two or three lines, that's fine. Um, option two is that you can use a URL shortener if you want, like you could go on Bitly and make a short URL. Um, that is primarily preferable if you're doing something that's more of like, uh, it's not meant to stay around forever. Like if you're writing a student paper, then it's fine to use a URL shortener as well. Um, if you are citing a work that has a DOI that's long, the DOI Foundation actually offers an official DOI shortener that you can use, and you pop in the long version of the DOI, and it gives you the short version, and you can use that in your reference as well. Great. Thank you, Chelsea. 
And then I have another question that, Tim, you might be able to answer about ordering entries in a reference list. And so that's how you order references if you have multiple works that share some of the, the same authors. So say you have two works and the first two authors are the same, and then that second work has an additional third author. How would you decide how to order them? I see. Uh, yes, you go um, the, the sort of letter by letter alphabetically. So the 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 work that had the two authors would precede the work that had the three authors. Um, you would just basically keep going through the names until you got to the one that differed. Right. And and uh, the principle there is that nothing precedes something. So. Absolutely. And what if they you were two works with all identical authors in a reference list? Mm -hmm. Um, so in the in the list, if they had all the same authors but different dates, it'd be chronological. If they had all the same authors and the same dates, you can add A and B, um, sorting them, um, ordering them by alphabetizing the title, the next element in the reference list. But um, you'd add A's and B's to the dates in both the reference and in the in-text citation. And um, I can say that um, I know it's a little hard to think about that abstractly, but it is um, on our website. We have. Excellent. Thank you. And then I got a couple questions about um, GUIs for print works. And so, Chelsea, maybe you can tell us what do you do if you have a print work? Do you need to worry about the DUI? What do you do in that case? If the print work has a DUI, you should put it in your reference. Uh, you can, if, if, you're, if you're looking at it on paper in front of you, you can retype it and then check it to make sure that it's right. Um, another thing that you can do is to go to the, ref, the website crossref.org, and crossref.org has a search box right on the main front page, and you just put in the title of the article that you want to cite, and it gives you the DOI, and then you can just copy and paste it. So it's a super easy and fast way to look up the DOI, and that is going to help others be able to retrieve that work. Excellent. Makes a lot of sense. And then another question is, if you are creating a reference for a web page, do you also have to include the title of the overarching website in the reference entry? Um, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. So sometimes, the answer is sometimes. It depends on who the author is. So if the author of the work, the author of the web page is the group, like say you're on the um, say you're on the APA website and the author of the page is American Psychological Association. Then you would provide the date and the title and now you're to the publisher, which is American Psychological Association again. And in order to avoid repeating that piece, you just skip it in the publisher. So it's to avoid repetition that you, um, that you omit it in the publisher spot if it's already in the present, if it's already in the author spot. However, if you're on a web page and it has individual authors, like say um, I wrote a web page, you would put my name in the author, and then when you got to the website name, you would include the website name as part of the reference. And so what you should do is you can look at the templates in the web pages and websites category, and that shows you where the pieces are, and then it also will describe when to omit the pieces if there's going to be repetition. Great. And then we got a couple questions about some of the specific databases, Chelsea, that you would talk about when you're accessing um, your works from those. Okay. So one of the questions was about Eric, and you had mentioned that they sometimes have widely available versus limited circulation works. Mm -hmm. So do all sources found in Eric need to include database information or only specific types of works that you access via Eric? That's a great question. Only the ones that are of limited circulation. You have to look at the work that you're citing. Excellent. And then someone was curious, in that ProQuest citation, where did that publication number that you had in parentheses, where did that come from? The publication number in the ProQuest slide is, I will, um, you they're talking about here a publication number. This is a number assigned by the database. It's on the record page. It says record number or publication number. So it's there on the page when you're in the database. And if, uh, if you don't see it or it's not there, just leave it out. And then a related question about these databases is that 
Is there any good rule of thumb for knowing whether a work is widely available versus of limited circulation? Yes, there is. The best way to know if a work is widely available versus limited circulation is to memorize this list of four bullet points. Journal articles, magazine and newspaper articles, books, ebooks, edited book chapters. If you can remember those, that list of um, common widely circulated works, that's going to cover a lot of what is commonly cited in papers. So Great. limited circulation is going to be like dissertations and monographs. That makes a lot of sense. And then if you are getting something, say a journal article via EBSCO, would you bother to make your reference um, link to the specific article or just to the home page from, say, for, of the publisher of that journal or just cite that you got it from EBSCO? The scenario in which the journal article does not have a DOI? Uh, let's say yes. Okay. Or, so actually, let's go through both for everyone. Okay. Sure. Okay. So you got it from EBSCO and it does have a DOI. So that means put the DOI in the reference, no database information. If it doesn't have a DOI and you got it from EBSCO, the journal article, which is on our list I just showed you, of widely available, so no database information. You just end the reference after the, the pages, if, if that's the case. And so in that case, the reference looks the same as if it were a print work. And the idea is that people are going to use the databases they have access to to get the work. Absolutely. So kind of going along that lines, you address this in secret number seven. But just to reiterate, so if your reader is a professor, so they would have access, access to your proxy or login materials, would you, in that case, would you be able to use the URL directly to those materials? If that's what you want, sure. If it works, go for it. So you're basically saying that if you're the professor, you can ask for that adaptation to APA style to ask your students to provide that URL. Go for it. Absolutely. But if you were submitting, say, that paper for publication with that same um, work, you'd probably admit it because they, readers generally wouldn't be able to access that work. Exactly. Excellent. And then, Tim, I know you had also touched on this question, but just to reiterate for a couple of people, if you are citing a work from a government agency, so there's a hierarchy. What do you include in the author element versus the source element of that reference? Sure. Um, so include in the author element the most specific agency. Um, so you'll see, let's say the report shows uh, a bunch of different agencies. You, you, it may be hard to tell. Sometimes you can tell by the way they've formatted the agency names. You can see which one is the, uh, the what the hierarchy is. Otherwise, maybe you do a little searching online to see what how those are organized. Either way, use one agency as the author, the specific agency, and then the parent agencies go as in, at the end of the reference in the source elements as the publisher. Excellent. And then one last question to address something, Tim, you also touched on. If you have an article that's academic but not necessarily peer-reviewed, do you need to include a bracketed description in the reference entry for that work? Um, if, it's, if it's academic but not peer-reviewed, it's a judgment call. It depends on what the type of reference, uh, what the type of document is. The idea is uh, if you want your reader to know what it is and they can't tell at a glance, add a bracketed description to, to help the reader. Excellent. All right, so there were a couple more specific questions. Unfortunately, we are 10 minutes over, so I will repeat that this um, presentation is recorded and will be available online for anyone wanting to watch. We also had a couple people who really liked the six steps of the citations. And so that is something that we um, can actually post on the APSI website, that little graphic for those of you who would like to send it to uh, your students there. And I'll also mention that there's a couple of things about references that people asked about that weren't covered in this presentation, like real legal references and citing works from indigenous elders. So those topics are addressed in the publication manual. Um, chapter 11 is all about legal references. And we say to look at the blue book if for anything not covered there. And then chapter 8.9 discusses um, some of the in-text citations for things like citing um, oral traditions. And I'll turn it back over to Mark to wrap us up. All right. Thank you, Haley. And thank you, Chelsea and Tim. Um, I think we had a really informative and insightful presentation today. So thank you so much for that. Um, I would just remind folks that are still with us out there, um, 
you should see in your chat box a link to a post webinar survey. If you could take a minute and fill that out to let us know how we did, did today, we would really appreciate that. And also, I would note, as has been mentioned a couple of times, we did record this, so be on, on the lookout for a follow-up email with that recording. Thanks to everybody out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope the rest of your day is great. Bye-bye. <laughs>